Okay, so um, what we're going to talk about this morning in chemistry is um, some uh, radical chemistry, some free radical chemistry, and this falls into uh, F332, uh, the atmosphere unit on our course. Um, so what I'm going to do is turn on some screen sharing. I've also got um, questions and answers enabled on here, I think. Um, so if anybody wants to ask a question, then uh, do feel free. Um, but I'm going to turn screen sharing on now so I can go onto my board. Okay, so there we go. So the first question is really, um, uh, what is a free radical? Let me find a pen. So a free radical is really something with an unpaired electron. Okay, so um, that's any chemical species you can imagine that's got an unpaired electron. So essentially, you're going to have an uneven number of electrons present. So just to give you a couple of um, examples, one that we'll be dealing with um, in a little while, which is a little bit notorious, is a uh, chlorine radical. So you indicate a radical with the presence of this little dot here. So that's um, your unpaired electron. You can have... Uh, hydroxyl radical, you could have NO2 is a radical, as is, sorry, that was NO, this is NO2 of course, these are both radicals, um, you can have things like CH3, that's a radical, that's what we'd call a methyl radical, so these things have all got unpaired electrons on them, and that makes them quite reactive. How reactive? varies from radical to radical. Okay, so I just put very reactive there. Um, so how do they form? Well, there's two ways you can, um, well, there's one way you make radicals, and that's by breaking a bond. So if I take um, chlorine, for example, this is a chlorine molecule, and if I break it into two chlorine radicals. Okay, now I can do this with some uh, ultraviolet radiation. That supplies sufficient energy. And you can use the equation E equals H mu, well this is the frequency and that is the um, uh, Planck's constant. To work out the frequency of the ultraviolet radiation you'd actually need. So if you take the bond enthalpy and get it into joules per mole, and then divide it by Avogadro's number, you'll get this energy here, and if you divide by Planck's constant, you'll get the frequency of radiation you'd need to actually break this bond. But if we've got two atoms which are the same here, or very similar, um, then they've got the same attraction for electrons, so what happens is one electron goes onto there, and the other electron goes onto that atom. So this is what we call a curly arrow, and curly arrows are used in chemistry to show the movement of electrons. And if you've got a one-headed curly arrow, that means one electron, or if you've got a two-headed curly arrow, that means two electrons. Okay, and this is what we call homolytic bond Fission. Okay, so that's breaking um, a bond equally. Um, there's another way you can break a bond, and if I take two atoms joined together which are not the same, this tends to be what happens in that case. Chlorine is more electronegative than hydrogen, so it pulls electrons towards itself more strongly. Chlorine's got a lot more protons in its nucleus than hydrogen has, but only one. Okay, uh, this happens in aqueous solution, for example. What we get is not radicals, but ions. So we get a hydrogen ion H plus and a chloride ion Cl minus. So the chlorine's gained an electron and the hydrogen's lost an electron. And that uneven splitting of a bond is called heterolytic fission. Fission is to break, of course. 
And um, what tends to happen is a lot of this homolithic bond fission goes on in um, the atmosphere. You've got a lot of UV radiation up in the stratosphere, and this is where you've got the ozone layer, and um, that breaks patterns like oxygen molecules, which we'll look at in a second, and you get a series of radical reactions. There are a couple of radical reactions that you should be um, aware of. And I'm going to do the simplest one first. And this leads on from uh, the HCl. We're going to make some HCl. There's a radical reaction between hydrogen and chlorine that takes place to make couple of moles of hydrogen chloride gas. This is a um, free radical reaction and it starts with the splitting of the chlorine molecule just like in this example up here to give us two chlorine radicals. Now that requires a little bit of UV radiation to get it going. It splits the chlorine molecule apart into two chlorine radicals and that is what we call initiation. So that starts the whole process. Then that chlorine radical that you've got attacks a hydrogen molecule, and what you get is whoops, you don't get that. You get HCl, which is um, a product molecule, and you get a hydrogen radical in that case. Your hydrogen radical then attacks a chlorine molecule which reforms a chlorine radical and makes another mole of HCl. So this thing here goes back there and restarts the whole process. These two steps together are what we call propagation. So they keep it going. So this is what we call a chain reaction. And um, chain reactions can be stopped when two radicals hit each other. So we could take a chlorine radical and a hydrogen radical, whack them together to make a product molecule HCl. That's not a radical, that's our product. That's where the process in this case stops. You could imagine other termination steps, which would be a couple of hydrogen radicals joining together to make hydrogen molecule or a couple of chlorine molecules joining together to make a chlorine molecule. So um, these are what we call termination steps. Okay, So that stops the process. So this starts it, this can makes it carry on, and this stops it. So let's look at a couple of other examples. One of them is, um, let's go for a different color for this example, let's go green, um, is free radical substitution in alkanes. of alkanes perhaps. Um, so uh, let's take, um, let's have uh, ethane. So alkanes will react with halogens a lot more slowly than alkenes. Alkenes react by electrophilic addition reactions. This is free radical substitution. So I could react it with bromine and we did a reaction a bit like this in the lab this week, except we used hexane. So that's the sort of reaction that's going on. So we're substituting a hydrogen for a bromine, and in this case we're making bromo-propane, um, and we're producing HBr as well. So this is a radical reaction, and this starts with a bromine molecule, been broken apart into two bromine radicals and that's our initiation step just like in the last example 
And um, to do that, with bromine, all you need is visible light. Okay, a bromine-bromine bond is significantly weaker than a chlorine-chlorine bond. Once you've got that chlorine radical, that will react with your alkene, alkane, rather. And it will give you CH3, CH2. It abstracts a proton from the um, halogen alkane to make some HBr, which is one of your products. And this thing here is called an ethyl radical. And your ethyl radical reacts with um, some bromine, and that makes your product, in this case, uh, bromo -pro um, ethane, and it reforms a bromine radical. So this bromine radical here again can go back and start the whole process over again. So this here is propagation. Okay. You can terminate this reaction by taking, say, an ethyl radical and reacting it directly with a bromine radical to make your target product. So termination steps are characterized where you join two radicals together. You could take two ethyl radicals join them together to make um, in this case butane and so on. Any two radicals you could pair together. The problem with this reaction is that once you've got this product here, this product can then carry on to react in the same way as the ethane molecule did here, and you can get further substitution going on. So you could get CH3, CH, Br2. Um, you could then get CH2. I've got bromine on the other end. Where the bromine goes is random more or less, and so on. So what you will get is a mixture of products, and this gets more pronounced the bigger the alkane is. So if you've got hexane, the bromine could substitute onto any of the carbons, and you'll get multiple substitution going on. I also notice that you can get these alkyl radicals, so the um, ethyl radical joining together to make bigger alkanes and then they can react with the bromine and they can undergo further substitution. So in terms of making substances, so synthesis, this is not particularly useful because you're going to get a very big um, mixture of products being produced. So um, it's useful from the point of view of answering exam questions but in terms of actually making something um, it's not at all useful. So let's just look at um, an atmosphere example. And where this becomes important in the stratosphere um, is in the production of ozone. So in the stratosphere there's lots of UV radiation. If you take an oxygen molecule what happens is that gets turned into two oxygen radicals by the presence of UV radiation and those oxygen radicals can then react with oxygen molecules to make O3 which is ozone. And This is how ozone is made in the stratosphere. O3 on the other hand absorbs ultraviolet radiation strongly, which is why it protects us from uh, the stuff, and it splits apart to make oxygen and uh, an oxygen radical again. But that oxygen radical can zap another oxygen molecule and reform the ozone. And the interesting thing about this series of reactions is we're taking UV energy to break bonds, which is an endothermic process, and then we've got this bond making process which is exothermic and that's liberating thermal energy into the atmosphere so the stratosphere is warmer 
than the atmosphere either side of it because of, you've got this free radical process taking place. Um, the issue comes when you introduce other free radicals there and I'll just give you one example um, and that will be a chlorine radical. Chlorine radicals, I'll do this in red because this is bad, um, come from molecules like this historically and also to some extent nowadays. That's a, a CFC, chlorofluorocarbon. These used to be used in refrigerators and um, as a blowing agent for things like polystyrene and in aerosols. They've been banned now because in the upper atmosphere they get broken down. This is an initiation step to make chlorine radicals. It's the chlorine radical which is a nasty beast because the chlorine radical can react with an ozone molecule to make an OCL radical and oxygen and that OCL radical itself can then go on to react with ozone to make more oxygen in fact two moles of oxygen, let's get that right, and reform the chlorine radical and that chlorine radical there is reformed and can then go on to zap another ozone molecule and if you notice if we add these two equations together what we get is 2O3 goes to 3O2 and it's been catalyzed by the chlorine radical. So a chlorine radical catalyzes the decomposition of ozone in the stratosphere. That's not the only radical which does this. If you read your chemical storylines, you'll find that other things can do this as well. NO2 behaves in exactly the same way as the chlorine radical. In fact, that's NO behaves in the same way as the chlorine radical and um, hydroxyl radicals behave in the same way as well. So you can substitute the Cl here for NO or OH and you can get the same mechanism going on and a different catalyst for the decomposition of ozone. So this is why these compounds were banned in things like aerosols. Um, because they left, led to the uh, growing hole over Antarctica in the ozone layer. So that's a brief look at the uh, radical chemistry that you need to know for F332. Um, you can uh, review this anytime on the community or my YouTube channel.